Welcome to Seattle Atheist Church. Atheists, agnostics, skeptics, whatever you like to call yourself, you are welcome here. At Seattle Atheist Church, we call ourselves an atheist church because you will never hear anything supernatural promoted from the podium. Our church is founded on the principles of scientific naturalism and secular ethics. Truth claims are attempted here and we stand ready to revise our thinking in light of new information. We attempt to be excellent to all conscious beings, and we believe in good. Because good works in non-mysterious ways. If that sounds right to you, then you are probably in the right place. So I have a couple of announcements. The first is we do this every Sunday at noon uh, here. So um, please come back and um, I, a different organization, a secular student organization at UW is having an event later on this afternoon. Uh, a former uh, preacher uh, turned atheist is coming to talk and if you're interested in that, please see Rick. Oh, there he is in the back uh, and he can get you the details. Also, next Sunday after church, we're going to have a pumpkin carving and you do have to sign up on Meetup if you want to get the details on that. If you uh, enjoy coming to church, uh, there are many ways you can help support us. One way is just to invite a friend. That's the, probably the most important way. And then also we do have a donation jar in the back of the room and you can donate off uh, CLAtheist.church. Those donations go to uh, just to rent the room. So uh, the, uh, another announcement I have is if you are going to be an upcoming speaker, please email uh, Stephen with a P-H-E-N um, at clatheist.church, your talk description, because as you, you don't need to know what the whole talk is going to be, but if you have an idea, just a couple of lines helps, uh, I think, get people here. So without further ado, uh, welcome, welcome. Uh, hear about, um, I can't see this, so I'm have to hold it. It's about um, uncertainty here. So, um, um, thinking about uncertainty uh, pretty quickly leads to thinking about reason itself. Uh, questions come up such as, what was the reason that happened? Or, what was the reason um, this or that was said? So. Um, before I get any further than that, I, I just want to clarify the type of uncertainty that I'm talking about. Uh, this is from the perspective of people making their own decisions. I'm, I'm not really looking at the cost of unknowns in a business um, or, say, uh, trying to figure out insurance or the weather or if, uh, if insurance is fair or not. I mean, that's uh, interesting, but just not what this is, uh, this is, what this is about. Um, and here are, um, here are some, um, some quotes that I, I wasn't able to work in, but I thought there were some very interesting quotes about uncertainty. Um, the first two um, are, uh, are some quotes that uh, typical uh, philosophy has some difficulties looking at. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, from a, they're, they're difficult to see from a typical analytical point of view, and the second two are uh, kind of responses to those two quotes. So the first quote is uh, straightforward, straightforward. Waiting is the hardest part. Tom Petty, right? <laughs> not knowing how, uh, not knowing uh, how something will end, can be the basis of uncertainty, um, either on a personal or a societal level. It can really just drive you insane. Um, the second quote, um, it's, uh, this is, I really like this quote. It's from a, a, a book uh, called The Name, the Name, of, the, uh, the Name of the Wind by Patrick, uh, I'm not gonna say this name right, Patrick Rothfuss. Um, and uh, uh, just a little setup uh, about, it's uh, just, just uh, <clears throat> After a, a, a young man and a young woman, after a night of uh, flirting, um, 
a guy walks uh, the girl to the door and they say goodbye. And after she is inside, uh, you hear his inner monologue. And he says, I should, have, I should have been bolder and kissed her at the end. I should have been more cautious. I talked too much. I said too little. And this is just a perfect example of uncertainty. It's all that you know at this point is that you are unhappy about what's going on. And there is simply isn't anything, any data to collect to help you understand if you acted in the best way that you could or in a good way or not. And that's just another way that we see uncertainty. And now a couple responses to those. Now this quote I don't have an, op an author for, but it's a good quote. <coughs> if, we don't expect if we don't expect certainty or utility or, or efficiency, we, we won't be upset when they fail to appear. Uncertainty is, a, is our inevitable, inevitable condition. Um, the second quote, uncertainty is not the problem. Believing that certainty is possible is the problem. <coughs> That's by Lao Tzu. We'll get to those last two quotes in a moment, but for right now you might just say, if I can find a logical reason for something, then I, would be, then I wouldn't be uh, uncertain about it anymore, right? Uh, I might not uh, like the outcome, but I shouldn't be uncertain about uh, that point anymore. Uh, well, that sounds simple enough. But when something comes up with a reasonable explanation for something, we have to understand that it, it, it can be a, a rationalization and if this is about a subject that many people are interested in, they could be doing the exact same thing. That is, coming up with their own reasonable explanation that settles their uncertainty. I'm going to talk about this by using a story, or at least um, a decision from a story, to be more specific. And I... <clears throat> about the different ways to interpret um, a decision that, uh, that uh, a very difficult decision that somebody has a... I, 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 <clears throat> let me start that over again. I'm going to use, I'm going to use a story, I'm going to use the same story, or at least a decision from that story, and different ways to interpret that decision to talk about different ways that people have dealt with and talked about uncertainty and reason. By the way, this uh, ended up, the rest, some of this ended up with a little bit more uh, history of philosophy-ish than I expected to, and this is kind of where it ended up going, and uh, thoughts about reason and Truth, and that's just kind of where it went. And if um, that's why I kind of wanted to get a story in here, so that's um, where, that's where it's uh, it's here. So the story that it was going, the story that it was going um, is going to be the example that's throughout. I was trying to find I, I was trying to find this episode from Star Trek: The Next Generation with that that that, uh, with that had Q in it, and I just couldn't find it. And uh, so I went to a different source. Uh, so I went to the Torah. I, I mean the Bible, I, what, the New Testament, or well, I mean the Old Testament, whatever you want to call it. So uh, keep in mind that this is a, a fictional, so I'm thinking this as a, 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 a fictional story. Um, so in this universe, God does exist, and God is an excellent plot device. <laughs> so this is a story many of you probably heard of, and mo most of you, uh, many, many of you know. And it is a story of Abraham and Isaac. So quick background on Abraham. Uh, this guy Abraham was a nice old man, um, and he was married, to, and, and his wife's name was Sarah, and she was barren. Also, this guy talked to God, and not just. 
I mean, like a back and forth talk. Abraham uh, kind of had a, uh, I don't know, a quid pro quo thing going with God. God blesses him and his wife and tells him to do things and he does them for God. Um, he moves to different places uh, as God commands. Uh, he, and then he sacrifices animals, namely goats. Apparently that's what God wanted, goats. And in return, uh, among other things, uh, Sarah became pregnant and they had a son. And anyway, both sides were happy. And uh, anyway, that's the backstory. And this is when things kind of get interesting. Uh, and this is kind of known basically as the, the binding of Isaac. And Isaac, uh, that's what that, that was his son. So one day, God tells, I, it, God tells Abraham that he doesn't want a goat sacrifice but he wants Abraham to go up on this mountain and sacrifice his son, Isaac. So they both go up on the mountain, and Abraham has this dagger out, ready to sacrifice, ready to kill him, basically, sacrifice him. And then God tells him that he doesn't need to go sacrifice him, but go get that goat over there instead and sacrifice him in return. So he does that, and in return, God gives him more blessings. So... The standard historical interpretation of this decision and the action by Abraham has really shown him as something good and even heroic. Listening to God without question. Just think, think about that situation and put yourself in that situation, situation that Abraham found himself in. That decision he had to make. It's hard to even fathom the idea of being in that situation where the right thing to do is to sacrifice your son without question or doubt. I think the closest thing that someone could come think about this is, is a similar situation would be asking a, a boss, asking an employee to do something illegal. But the main difference is here, besides killing your son, are that you would understand that your boss is motivating. Motivations are in some, there is some motivation for your boss doing this. Either your boss is doing this for him to make money or your boss is doing it for some other reason, uh, to silence him, whatever, you know, there's a, there's a motivation behind this. It's not just, there, there's something there. And, and the second reason is that this, analogy between a boss doesn't really work all that well because this isn't a boss. This is, this is freaking God. Uh, bosses can, can seem powerful, but this is God. God, I, again, in this, this universe, God is the most powerful thing. And so it would be this thing. So this is a something, this just shows that something that religion, this metaphor here, or story here, this is, some, is, this is something that religion is really good at. Uh, the, the, showing that Abraham did this. He, removing the uncertainty that he had about killing his son. By find, and he found that certainty through faith. Abraham, again, seen heroic as heroic for being able to put his full faith in God and certain for doing that right thing. So that's kind of basically, that's the traditional story and interpretation of the binding, it was called the binding of Isaac, and that decision of Abraham. Now, eventually, people didn't really have as much, uh, started to lose faith. Uh, people stopped uh, having as much, uh, well, faith in faith. <laughs> and they would look uh, back at this story through uh, different eyes. And uh, while this happened, this happened little by little, there was a huge rejection in favor of reason in, 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 a, in a specific time in human history. And this happened at the time that uh, basically called the Enlightenment. And so just some quick historical context about the Enlightenment. Uh, it gets named the, uh, 
the Enlightenment from uh, this philosopher, his name was Immanuel Kant, and he had an essay called What is, Enlight what is Enlightenment? Uh, Kant famously describes uh, enlightenment as man's removal of the self-incurred tutelage. What he's, referring, what, what he's referring to is the tutelage of thousands of years of religious dogma. Later on, he challenges the thinkers of his time to dare to know or dare to think for yourselves for once. In other words, we need another way other than religious faith to be able to arrive at the truth uh, about things. Because faith, faith, from, from these thinkers' perspectives, caused a lot of problems historically. And this has not been the best way possible to arrive at certainty. Well, the thinkers of the time took a look around them. They looked at, at all the available options. And they uh, collectively decided to double down on this reason instead of faith. And this was the, the age of reason. This wasn't just philosophy. This was uh, it's the start of uh, Newton and the scientific method. This became the standard way to do science. This was the use of, of, of uh, rational categories and uh, putting our belief in the evidence, the political systems of the time, uh, turning towards individuals and uh, political systems tur turning towards the uh, political systems of the time, turning towards the individuals, individual subjects and uh, social contracts as opposed to uh, the roles that people had to play in society. This time was basically the beginning of the United States. So what happened? Well, so what happened was each philosopher and scientist during their work, we seem to be coming to terms with how everything in the universe fits neatly into rational categories. We were finally understanding the truth about all, the, about all these things over these years. With every progressive scientific experiment, there was undeniably, that was undeniably bringing us an understanding of a natural world that improved the lives of people. How could any reasonable person say the process of science wasn't accessing something of the truth about reality? Well, they did just that. But back to Abraham for a second to say what was going on through that story. At this point, at this point a new verdict had been reached about Abraham. Well, instead of seeing him as the heroic figure, they, they, uh, they said, well, well, uh, well, well, Abraham did have a duty to God, and that is extremely important. He had to, he was carrying out his duties, and that was something he did, and that was something he needed to do. However, Abraham, besides those duties, those, some of those duties became in conflict with a big part of what Kant called his rational categorical imperative, that, that is a uh, basically a universal law, when, when God told him to kill his son. That is, Abraham is seen as using, that, that part of that is Abraham is seen as using one person for his own means. It's a big no-no for Kant. So by this account, Abraham's certainty was simply wrong. And by raising that knife above his son's head, it can be reasoned he was ready to commit murder and he just should not be looked at as a hero. And for the last, the last stage here, for the final... So the new strategy that had been in using, for the new strategy of using, of using reason to replace all uncertainty. <clears throat> Excuse me.
excuse me, the new strategy of, of using reason to replace all uncertainty seemed extremely reasonable at this time for all these philosophers. Ironically, that was exactly the problem with the strategy, that it seemed, it ended up seeming reasonable at the time. Later philosophers, like Nietzsche, saw the work that had been done at, uh, at the Enlightenment as an absolutely giant missed opportunity. Because hypothetically, this was a moment when philosophers could have realized that one of the biggest problems with those faith-based views of the world centered around the idea of, of religious certainty was certainty, certainty itself. What these thinkers did, Nietzsche said, is throw out certainty that caught the, the certainty that caught the religious certainty that caused them so many problems in the past and just change the criteria for what makes something certain. Rationality then becomes our new path to certainty. They just replace one dogma for another dogma. These guys have more questions here, and this is back to the Abraham story. They weren't so sure about if uh, Abraham was all of a sudden just a murderer. These guys had this question. They said, if God is all good, is he above Kant's universal law or not? Also, if Abraham had thought this, I, if, if Abraham had questioned God, his questioning of God would basically be thinking, thou shalt not kill. And this kind of is a paradox. And the, 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 this thinking goes to um, Soren Kierkegaard. And Soren Kierkegaard has a quote, and I'm kind of paraphrasing it here, but he says, here are all these philosophers and scientists at his time that understand the deepest levels of reality and existence. And here he is, and he can't even understand the story of Abraham. What he's saying is science and rationality during his time is supposedly producing some of the most comprehensive understanding of reality that we've ever had. But when it comes to certain aspects of what it means to be a human, rationality just, just can't always help you. It's just not a useful tool in every context. So many things about your life on an everyday level, humans, <clears throat> so many things, a human existence is filled with paradox. There are times in our lives, as Abraham's choice about, it, about uh, Isaac, there are times when, face, when continuing to face a paradox requires irrationality. Kierkegaard thinks that irrationality is an important part of being a person and being alive. Really, just as important as rationality. And if you ever try to swear off irrationality completely and make purely rational choices all the time, you'd be left in a state of total paralysis. A perfect example of this, uh, to describe this phenomenon, uh, comes from a guy named uh, Lloyd Kramer. So take this example. There's this thing about the universe that, that, that we call time. We want to use rational analysis to understand it better. So we measure it, uh, record and study it through the use of tools and rational analysis, and we call them clocks. Now for a clock, seconds are uniform. 60 seconds to a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, then, you know, time. When viewed purely through the lens of rational analysis, that's what time looks like. But is that how we experience time? Is that how time feels? 
Well, no. Sometimes time flies. Sometimes a few seconds or uh, something feels like an hour. The, the, the point is, when it comes to understanding something, clocks might help be helpful. But when it comes to understanding aspects of our experience, even about what, they're, what clocks are being used for, something that a rational tool just cannot tell the full story. Now, it should be said, nobody on, on either side is, is trying to do away with reason. Nobody's trying to do away with science. They're, they're, they're trying to do away with what they see as dogma, or the idea that what reason and science provides is access to certainty. This is why Nietzsche thought that people like Kant at the beginning of the Enlightenment, Enlightenment missed out on this big opportunity. There, again, could have been that moment when they realized that certainty about things should have, shouldn't have ever been the goal in the first place. We should value reason, we should value science, but not deify them.